Search Talk Live with search engine optimization and marketing experts Robert O'Haver and Caleb McKelvin, powered by the Robert Palmer family of companies. All right, we're back for another episode of Search Talk Live. My name is Robert O'Haver, and with me is Matt Weber, filling in for Caleb McKelvin because he's out with his new baby. <laughs> Welcome, Matt. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, yeah. Matt is with Roar Internet Marketing Company here in Orlando, Florida. If you want to check out their website, it's RoarWebDesign.com. Um, or is it Roar on the web? I'm sorry. They'll both get you the same place. <laughs> okay. All right. And then uh, just those of you tuning in for the first time to Search Talk Live, Search Talk Live, we talk about everything digital marketing wise. Um, it could be search engine optimization. It could be uh, social media. A couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Olga from Rush on SEM Rush over here are on the show and I can't talk today. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, we cover it all. I mean, and we try to cover every aspect i mean i know it's not possible to cover it in one hour but if you listen to past episodes you can go to searchtalklive.com and listen to those and we try to cover just about every little aspect of seo of search engine marketing paid you name it so yeah so today we have a special guest and one i'm pretty excited we've had him on the show before um he is the author of Google Power Search, social e-commerce, and my special, my favorite is The Art of SEO, one of the top selling SEO books in the industry. Uh, with us today is Stefan Spencer. Stefan, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I'm glad to have you on. <laughs> today, we're going to talk about uh, SEO audits, site audits. And uh, that's quite a big topic to cover because I mean, there's there's so many aspects. Used to it go used to go, uh, let's go search for let's go see where the keywords are the most popular and go for that. But that's changed nowadays. Um, there's there's everything from you know your competition to you know to to uh, mobile friendliness to speed, uh, you, you name it. I mean, you can run the gamut on it. But uh, where would you like to start? Right. So well, let's start with the overall structure of an audit. So let's say that somebody's going to do their own audit. So a DIY do it yourself audit. Gotcha. Um, if you think about like three major components to the audit, there's the technical section, mm -hmm. there's the content section, and then there's the link analysis section, right? right? So that matches up to the three pillars to SEO, which are content, architecture, and links. So sure. if um, the architecture includes the technical stuff, so that's Usually the, the hardest part to wrap your head around, unless you're a, a really gifted SEO, you mm -hmm. know, all the different tools, you are just kind of living and breathing all the geeky stuff like um, XML sitemaps, robots.txt directives, 301 redirects, duplicate content, um, microdata, you know, schema.org markup, all that sort of st geeky yeah. stuff. Right, right. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, before yep, you go, go on, I want to, for the listeners, I want to make sure everybody has a pen and paper because I'm sure Stefan's going to give a bunch of tools and, and stuff that you might want to write down. Oh, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you mentioned a tool already, a, a mobile-friendly uh, a, a mobile friendly test. So you just Google it. A lot of these tools are just easily found just by doing a Google search. So mo mobile-friendly test, it's mm -hmm. a free tool from Google. It'll check to see if your site is mobile-friendly. And if it isn't, then you're going to, over time, suck in the mobile search results in Google. And you don't want that. I mean, obviously, you, you want to rank in mobile search where over 50% of searches are happening on mobile devices. And it's never going back to desktop being the, the number one. It's always going to be mobile into the future. So you really need to have a mobile-friendly site and mobile-optimized. Um, but yeah, we, we can dig into some of the technical, uh, stuff now, or we could go into more of the, uh, the link analysis, uh, portion, or we could go into the content optimization section. Where would you like to start? You know, let's start a little bit about content because I think the very beginning of the process is what do I want to rank for? Can you help the audience talk through wh what's the target? How does the audience pick? What do they want to win? Right. So finding out which keywords are popular with searchers is a really critical first step in the process because if you're going after the wrong keywords, your, your 
chasing after the, the wrong goal. So the right keywords are ones that are not only popular um, according to tools like the Google AdWords Keyword Planner. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another tool to write down. Um, but also are attainable for you to rank for, right? And also are um, relevant to your business, obviously. Right. right. So all three criteria have to be met in order for you to ha have a good keyword. But you're not just going to go after one keyword. You're not going to go after like the trophy keyword that um, uh, is, is going to change your business or whatever, right? You're, you're, you have a whole portfolio of keywords. So this is kind of outside of the scope of an audit is to do the whole keyword strategy and identify a portfolio of hundreds or thousands or maybe tens of thousands of keywords. But what you would do as part of an audit is identify at least a handful, maybe a dozen, two dozen, three dozen keywords that you want to rank highly for because they're great keywords according to those three criteria. So now you've identified these keywords, you know what to go after, and um, you want to check things like uh, what are my current rankings uh, for these keywords. You go into Google Search Console, another tool to write down, right? Um, uh, Google Search Console in the Search Analytics report will tell you how many clicks you're getting for the keywords that you're ranking for uh, and, and getting visibility on. So you'll see impression data and you'll see click data from Google Search Console, formerly known as Google Webmaster Tools. Yeah. So, so this is all helpful data to give you a baseline for, all right, what are we doing in terms of these keywords? Do we, do we rank for them? And then juxtapose uh, your competitors. Pick maybe three competitors, not like 10, but just like a few competitors that you're going to juxtapose yourself against and say, all right, uh, here's uh, my rankings for, let's say, a dozen keywords. I'm at position two for this one, position six for this one, et cetera. And then here are my top three competitors and their rankings for these different keywords. Yeah. So, so you do that and you, you also are going to look at um, uh, search volume numbers and see, so well, these, these are my 12 favorite keywords and here are the search volume numbers for each. So that would be on, an, on, on another sheet or, or slide if you're using PowerPoint. Um, see, for when I do audits, I don't create some 50 page word document because that's just kind of untenable. Sure. Instead, I create them in, in PowerPoint. So I'll ha end up having, because I do really in-depth audience audits. It takes me four to six weeks to produce an audit. Wow. It's a lot wow. of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work, but I also charge a lot for it because it takes so much time. And when I present my findings, I'm spending on average four and a half to five and a half hours presenting my findings and recommendations. Now that's across all three major sections of the audit, content and link analysis and technical. But you can get a, a glimpse for the kind of scope we're talking about when you when you sign up for such a major initiative. But you're not gonna do that if you're doing it yourself. You're going to kinda you know, do the best you can with some of the more inexpensive tools and uh, just kind of yeah, do, do some basic blocking and tackling. And then if you get some ROI off of that, then maybe you have some budget to spend on, on an expert to hire for a, a deeper dive SEO audit. You know, and, and, I'm sorry. Another thing I wanted to add that you can use as a good source is if you're already running an ad campaign in AdWords or something and you're, you've got a, a specific keyword phrase or something that's converting really well, then, you know, obviously that's a no brainer, but I did. Yeah. And, it, well, it's great uh, to when you're doing the keyword strategy. Like I said, is a kind of a separate um, del deliverable or se separate kind of document uh, from the audit. But there are so many sources for great keyword data. When uh, look at uh, competitors, for example, use tools like SEM Rush, which you just mentioned a few minutes ago, and search metrics, and see what keywords they're getting traffic on and ranking for, right. uh, because it, They'll, they'll have thousands and thousands of keywords potentially for a, a website and you can export that, pull it right into an Excel spreadsheet or, um, you know, whatever your favorite tool is and start kind of slicing and dicing the data and looking for the keyword opportunities that are non-brand, not related to your competitor's brand name, but are 
good generic non-brand keywords that you'd want to include in your portfolio. And just because you're already ranking or already getting traffic on a keyword doesn't mean that it's a good keyword to target. It right. might be that you're just kind of looking and driving your car basically by looking in the rearview mirror, what you've already gotten, like in Google Analytics and Google Search Console, instead of what I could be getting by doing some competitive intelligence using tools like SEMrush and search metrics. Sure. There's been a lot written on semantic deviations of words and how the keyword planner handles them. Should a business be creating content for plastic surgeon and cosmetic surgeon or car sales and auto sales. What's your take on that? Yeah, the, what a great question. Um, he, here's the thing that it actually is somewhat broken in the Google AdWords Keyword Planner, um, which incidentally, every one of your listeners should be using to do keyword research. Um, and you just sign up for a Google AdWords account and you just it's totally a, a must have. They made so, it public again. Yeah. 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 So if, if you, okay, so try the simple test, put in a keyword and a, um, a plural variant of that. So singular and plural of uh, a, a favored keyword, let's say laptop and laptops, you're going to find that the numbers are the same. This is, this is how the tool is essentially broken. Yeah. It didn't used to be that way. And this is not a value add. This is not like, oh, well, Google's treating entities, you know, in you know, blah, blah, blah. No, they've actually uh, broken the tool. Because what you'll find is if you do a search for laptop in Google, mm -hmm. you're going to get different search results. You get a n different estimated number of results. You'll get different results in the t top 10. It's, it's all different from the plural. And yet the numbers that are being returned are the same. Uh, out of the tool, out of the keyword planner tool, are the same. Uh, and you can't tell what percentage of that number is the singular and what percentage is the plural. Now, Google is smart enough to, to differentiate and, and group and, and create entities and all that. And yet, we're getting different search results for these different keywords. So hmm. I prefer to get the actual numbers for the actual keyword that is on my, my list, right? So right. In, my, in, in my spreadsheet, I want to know that in the case of laptops, plural, it's only half as popular of a search uh, keyword as uh, the laptop singular. You also, and you, you would have to put yourself in that searcher's, you know, mind and, and try to get the user's intent for the search before you, you know, you lock down on that certain keyword. You, you yeah, know. exactly, exactly. Because if you are doing a search for a certain model number, of a refrigerator or something, you're pretty far down the buy cycle right. for that, right? You, you, the in, intention is high unless you're already purchased it and then you're just looking for the manual, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if, if you're just doing a very generic keyword search, um, non-specific like shoes or whatever, not, not like uh, black uh, leather loafer shoes and then a brand name or something, but you, you're right. just doing a, a, just a more generic search. Mm -hmm. The, intentionality of I'm going to whip out my wallet now and make a purchase is not as high. So um, a lot of people don't kind of bake that into right. their keyword strategy, like where in the buy cycle is this particular keyword. So um, yeah, I, I don't want to get too far off topic though of SEO audits sure. into the keyword strategy because like I said, it really should be done as a f full you know, major deliverable kind of thing, not not just as a little add-on piece as part of an audit. So if you come it, it across deserves a, a lot of focus. A website and you say, wow, these guys have got their target established. They've, they've got the right target. What are you looking for in terms of the, the content structure when you're doing an audit? What are you looking for for the content structure? Um, uh, what do you mean exactly? Are you um, looking for how the content is, is formatted on the page in terms of paragraph length, header tags, et cetera? Or are you looking for length? Are you looking for, for both? What are you looking to analyze when you look at content? Okay. So let me first differentiate. Great question. And let me first differentiate strategies versus tactics here. So from a strategic perspective, 
none of those questions would address like what's the strategy for your content marketing? What's the strategy for you creating um, compelling content that drives uh, clicks that drives conversions that drives shares and likes and retweets and plus ones and all that and links. So that's more of a strategic question, right? And and the tactical sort of questions like, is this a long enough uh, a page of content or is it thin content? Is this uh, marked up appropriately? Is there um, microdata markup? Uh, did you use uh, uh, an H1 tag or whatever. In fact, there's a lot of things that are red herrings, right? You, you don't, uh, you don't know what you don't know when it comes to SEO, right? And unless you're one of the experts like, like us. So a lot of people throw around these, th this terminology like, oh yeah, H1 tags. But in reality, an H1 tag is of no value. If, if you were to change all your H1 tags to font tags, watch and see what happens. A whole lot of nothing. You just made all your H1 tags go away and you replace them all with font tags mm -hmm. or H6 or whatever you want. No rankings uh, drop. Mm. And this has been the case for years. Some people will say, well, I'm, uh, uh, that's not what I'm getting because I added H1 tags to my site and my rankings really improved. And what they forgot to mention is they threw in a bunch of other stuff into the mix at the same time. Well, actually, they had no headline at all. Mm -hmm. right. so now they yeah. added a keyword-rich, prominent uh, bit of copy at the top of the page. And they happened to also wrap it within an H1 container. But they didn't already have that headline, and it was in a font tag or something other than an H1, and then they turned it into an H1. No, they added some keyword-rich copy and it was prominent in the page. So keyword prominence, that definitely makes a difference. Keyword density, no, that's another red herring. But keyword prominence, yes. In fact, it's an H1 tag, no. Now, I include analysis on H1s and meta descriptions and stuff that don't move your rankings in my audit anyways because I will inevitably get asked the question, well, what about meta descriptions? <laughs> Even meta keywords. Well, wh wh why isn't wow. meta keywords in the audit? And it's like, oh, God, okay, here we go again. So meta keywords never counted in Google. Never, ever, ever counted in Google. And here, here's the blog post on Google, Webmaster Central blog, that shows that they never counted in Google. Google went on record to say that. So, uh, And that's a great screening question, by the way, if you're trying to uh, hire an SEO to help you, ask them what their process is for optimizing meta keywords. And if they say <laughs> anything other than, Meta keywords never, ever, ever counted in Google, yeah. and they're a complete and utter waste of time and always have been. If they say, well, they don't matter as much as they used to or some other nonsense, you, you kick them out the curb, you know, to the curb. So, um, yeah, you, you got to include the tactical stuff. But you also inc include the strategic stuff, too, the things that will like, all right, is this copy solving a problem? Is it worthy of people linking to it? Those are really important questions. Mm -hmm. Like, sure, it's important to see, well, it, you know, th this page has almost no copy on it. <laughs> so that's kind of a problem. But if you look at the page from this kind of critical eye of this needs to deserve to rank, not because it has the certain number of words required and placement of, of keywords in the right uh, places in the copy and, uh, you know, ha has a prominent headline with keywords in it and, you know, the title tag has good keywords, blah, blah, blah. No, it's got to be like compelling mm -hmm. because we're heading towards a future of artificial intelligence determining whether your pages are going to rank or not. Yep. Right. So rank brain is now across a hundred percent of all search queries, not 15% like they announced last year, but a hundred percent. And I predicted that last year. I'm like, you know, this is going to be only a short period of time before it's going to a hundred percent. And then machine learning goes to full blown AI, artificial intelligence. And we won't be dealing with link building anymore because links will not be the foundation of the rankings algorithm. Now they still are still right. the, the top three signals, according to Google relevance links and rank brain. 
So you talk about, oh, well, I got to do the schema markup and I got to do my uh, XML site maps and everything. That's all very tactical. You got to think about the bigger picture, the strategy, because in the right. art of war, Sun Tzu said, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. So you're going to be running around, shooting off a lot of fireworks, and you're going to get slaughtered because you're messing around with, you know, optimizing your XML site maps and your competitor is creating the most compelling content marketing campaigns that get a ton of visibility links and shares and buzz and everything and deserve to rank on page one. And what are you doing? You're just making little tweaks and, you know, turning dials and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think the idea is about what someone once termed uh, water cooler content. Could you ever see yourself talking about this content at a water cooler, right? Is it worth talking about to somebody else. And if you, if you can't pass that test, then it's probably not the level of content you need to be successful. Yeah. Kind of like what uh, the Rand uh, is preaching now is 10 X content. Uh, absolutely. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and the way I term it is remarkable content. Mm -hmm. Is it worth remarking about? And that's Seth Godin's definition from the purple cow. Is it worth remarking about? That's the definition of remarkable. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, go back to square one and start over, yeah. right? So, so many, especially e-commerce sites get this wrong. They're just adding keyword rich copy to pages because they just have all these category pages that have nothing on them except product thumbnails and product names. And essentially you have a contentless page because there's no text there other than links. Right. When you, all you have is anchor text, you don't have any content. Mm -hmm. That all that, all the anchor text links all that uh, anchor text is associated with the pages that you're linking to. It, it's not setting a, a, a strong keyword theme for the page that you're looking at. Right. And so you kind of mentally set all that link text aside and you say, all right, so what's left? I'm glad oh, you said the copyright statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm, nice gl photos. I'm glad that you said that because that is a, a misconception that, you know, the keywords, the anchor text on that page is for that page when it, it's actually telling the, you know, when they're going through the site to, uh, to, to, uh, can't think of the word, not spider, but crawl, crawl. Thank you. <laughs> um, to crawl the page that they, it's telling them that, Hey, this is what this next link's about or this mm -hmm. page. Right. For those of you just tuning in, you're listening to search talk live. We are sponsored by the Robert Palmer family of companies. You can go to Robert Palmer companies.com uh, and check out all the different offerings the company has. Uh, we, if you're looking to refinance your home or do a, you know, a mortgage on your home, you can go to rpfunding.com. This is one of the Robert Palmer family of companies. Uh, we are talking with Seven Spencer, um, three-time author of digital marketing books such as uh, Art of SEO. Uh, help me out, Steph. <laughs> Sorry. Um, social e-commerce. Social e and Google okay. Power Search. Perfect. Yeah. And, and before we jump off to another one of the three legs of the of the audit, let's talk just a little bit about duplicate content and give us your take on, in quotes, what is duplicate content now? And how does a, a company who's got a e-commerce site where they're selling 20 of the same things that 19 other people are, how do they handle content and not yet be duplicate content? Yep. Good question. So um, let's start off by differentiating duplicate content that happens within your own site and duplicate content that happens outside on the web, right? So you, you gave an example of duplicate content that's happening externally, other competitors, other distributors or whatever, getting the same copy that you're getting and using from the manufacturer on your site. It's on 20 other websites. Mm -hmm. There's also duplicate content that happens uh, because of misconfigurations in, uh, in terms of your own platform. Right. And that is easy to fix if you know what to look for. And um, it's oftentimes kind of hidden to people. They're just not, they don't know how to, how to find that stuff. Are you, right? are, and, are you referring to like, you know, if you have a certain product, it's in multiple categories or something like that? Or, or? For, for example, yes. Mm -hmm. And, a lot of times what will happen is you'll make links crawlable that shouldn't be that, uh, for example, change the sort order. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially the same content. It's just uh, in a different order. 
So that's essentially duplicate content, sure. right? Or you have tr tracking parameters in your URLs and like source equals blog or source equals email newsletter or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they load up the same page of content, but they're different URLs. And so if those get um, uh, crawled and indexed, now you got multiple copies of that same whatever product page, category page, blog post in Google. And now you're competing with yourself. Essentially, you've cloned a bunch of pages inadvertently, and they're all competing for the rankings. And the way that the Google duplicate content filter works, it's not, it's, it's not a penalty, it's a filter. Right. You're not going to get penalized for duplicate content. What will happen is that query time, Google's going to decide which, um, uh, which page is the preferred page that uh, you know is a duplicate or near duplicate to these other pages, and then all the other pages that are duplicate or near duplicate are going to get filtered away. Mm -hmm. Query time. So it it's uh, um, it depends on the query whether you're going to get filtered out or your competitor is going to get filtered out or one of your variants that you really don't want displayed in the search results is the one that's picked and then the one that you really wanted is the one that gets filtered out because if you have five copies of the same page at differing urls because you allowed these tracking parameters to get indexed um and you haven't done proper like canonical tags to throw out a right. geeky term or um let's say the canonical tags not even being obeyed because it's only a hint google right. does not uh, always obey these canonical tags, so you, uh, canonical link element to be more technically accurate. If you do a simple like Google search, and this is where my book Google Power Search really comes in handy with all the advanced query operators. If you do a, a, a search on Google for site colon and then the um, domain of your site dot com, no mm -hmm. space after the colon, and then you add in URL colon, so now you add a space. <laughs> because this is a whole other separate query word, in URL, I-N-U-R-L, colon, and then let's say it's some tracking parameter like, um, I don't know, G click ID or, or it's uh, UTM source or it's, um, it's, you know, whatever, right? OPC or whatever the tracking parameter is. Right. You want to see if any of those are getting picked up by Google. Even though you had canonical tags correctly implemented, I bet you you'll find a number of pages that are still getting indexed with that tracking parameter. Sure. And, yeah. and not to get too technical with this, but like in the robots text file, you, or you can control a lot of that or not the, I'm sorry, the HT access file. You can control a lot of that. If you, you know, if you're, if you're working with the, you know, well, it depends on the site, your platforms or your, the, the hosting you're doing with your, your website, but you can, prevent a lot of that from being even indexed. Yeah, I always like to tell people that Google is really the super nanny of the internet. It wants everything nice and neat and in nice little boxes. It doesn't like frayed ends. It doesn't like copies of things. Right. So the more compulsive you can be about the neatness of your website, the better you are going to be for sure. factors like this. And Google's gotten pretty good at, you know, like especially if we're with WordPress sites with, with uh, tags. Google knows that, you know, that, that tag is a copy of that page, but if it's in that tag URL and in our structure, then it's going to, it's going to take that canonical and help point to that original document. We've kind of jumped yeah. off into the technical side yeah, we're going, on that. So sorry, let's, we have. Yeah, sorry. But let's, let's stick with it for just a little bit. And Stefan, can you give us maybe the, the top two things you see done incorrectly when you look at the technical side of an SEO audit? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll tie this in with our uh, previous discussion that we just finished on duplicate content. So big mistake I see a technical um, mistake is that people will use the, the uh, disallow directive in robots.txt to block the, the spiders, to right. block Googlebot and uh, Bingbot. And unfortunately... If they are trying to do that to mitigate duplicate content issues, what they've done is they've stopped this, the, the, the Googlebot uh, crawler from accessing the pages, and they haven't stopped those pages from getting um, listed in the search results. So um, 
it, depending on this on the search query, you could very well find uh, search listings that will show it, it will kind of a weird looking snippet that says something to the effect of this list. No further information is available about this listing because of its robots.txt file. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you've seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. The problem you created by using the wrong uh, robots.txt directive is that you've blocked the spider and instead you meant to stop the spider, the crawler, from um, showing the page in the, in the search results. Right? Actually, the algorithm from uh, not, not the spider per se is the problem, but the ranking algorithm, you, you want that page pulled out of the search results, right? So to mm -hmm. pull it out of the index, out of the big database, the big distributed database that Google has, and stop showing that in the search results. That is called no index. Right. Big difference between no index and disallow. So people are using disallows all the time. If you go put in yourdomain.com slash robots.txt, you're going to see a whole bunch of disallow directives. I bet you're not going to see a single no index directive. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is about no index as a robots.txt directive is it's unofficially supported by Google. It's unsupported and doesn't work in Bing but it is unofficially supported, thus it could be taken, you know, uh, support could be taken off at any time by Google and this would not work anymore. So um, a better approach is to use the no index, the, the meta robots no index tag in the HTML. So here's where people screwed up again. And again, it's just a, a sh you don't know what you don't know in terms of all these technical nuances. So they add the meta tag, and then they do not remove the disallow directive. So guess what happens? You add this meta tag to the page, and you continue to tell Googlebot, hey, don't come here, don't go to this page and access it. So all this uh, information in the HTML, including the meta tag uh, for uh, dropping the page out of the index, is never read. Great, great tip, great tip. Yeah. So, so here's the, here's the advice specifically remove the disallow directives from your site for pages that you want to drop out of the index, out of the search results, remove the disallow directives, stop using disallows because that's the incorrect lazy person's way of doing it. It doesn't <laughs> even work right. And, uh, now you have a much shorter, uh, robots.txt file and you're going to handle the uh, dropping of these pages out of the search results using a meta tag, the meta robots meta tag. So it goes meta name equals robots, content equals no index. Mm -hmm. Now you've got pages that you don't want to appear in the database, but you also have some pages that you don't think are rank worthy. Maybe you've got a page with a form on it and maybe we want to do a no index on that for the purpose of limiting the number of pages that any incoming link it's diluted to. Is that a proper use of no index? Um, kind of. And, and here's, here's where the problem uh, comes in. Again, another technical nuance. Um, yes, we don't want these pages to show up in the search results because they're low value pages. Uh, like email this page uh, to a friend sort of thing, right? right. So, or or a printer friendly version of this page. You know, the, the, you don't want those in the search results. So, Meta no index would be an appropriate um, thing for that, except you just mentioned, well, we want to get these, uh, we, we want the link authority to flow to the more important pages, not to these low value pages. Here's, and here's the rub. With a meta no index or with a no index directive in robots.txt, and by the way, if you want to use the no index directive, you have to do user agent colon Googlebot in your robots.txt mm -hmm. file, and then your, list, your no index uh, directives, and then you're going to use user agent star, and then do your disallows for the other search engines. Gotcha. Okay, but um, uh, I completely lost my train of thought. So, uh, you were talking we're, we're, about whether or not we want to sculpt the link juice. How do we get that link juice to go to the no value you. pages? Right, so, so here's the problem is no indexing causes the page still to get crawled and for the links for the, that page will inherit page rank and that page will pass page rank. Mm -hmm. If you do not want the page to pass page rank, then you add another 
um, command to the meta robots tag, and that is no follow. So then it no follows, it blocks all page rank from flowing to all the links on the page. Now, Steph, let me ask you on this. Uh, now, on in a case like that where he was saying the contact form, wouldn't you want to let, I mean, obviously Google's not going to rank that page anyway, right? So is it even worth throwing that no index on a page like that? No, I would not do that on a contact page. And the right. reason why is because even though there's not a lot of content on there, if I do a, a long tail search query for uh, like, uh, I don't know, your your office headquarters right. or for uh, your toll-free number or whatever, and it's not on your homepage for whatever bizarre reason, but it's on the contact page, Right. we want that page to show up. Absolutely. Good point. Right. But there are low-value pages that uh, Google would would term as, as thin content mm -hmm. that we don't even want indexed. Privacy or policy. Crawled. Yeah, yeah. No, privacy policy is one of those pages that I'd say if I'm doing a long tail query and I want to see that you have a privacy policy because I'm one of those kind of like uh, electronic frontier uh, foundation uh, uh, donating people who really cares about privacy mm -hmm. um, and not knocking them. I think privacy is important and um, it's, you know, essentially we have none anymore, but. If I'm if I care about that, I'm going to want to do a kind of a privacy policy type of search. I want to know uh, quickly what your your policy is, what your terms of use are, and so forth. So those pages should still be indexed. But thin content pages that are essentially, uh, you know, let's say no results return, right? So I, I have a client that I just found this uh, issue with them. So they have a big e-commerce site. And they have a proper custom error page. It serves the proper 404 status code. That's another thing to check. Make sure that your error page actually returns a 404 status code in the HTTP header. You'll use a header checker tool like um, just Google it. Server header checker. Pick one of the first ones and then put in a URL. Uh, and and after your .com or you know whatever your top level domain is, add some nonsense like ASDF, ASDF, and see it that it returns a 404 status code. Otherwise, your page, your, your site essentially has no edges. It looks like an infinite uh, crawl space to Google and, and your site doesn't look very uh, search engine friendly to Google anymore. You, you don't want to have that. That so, is a but, great tip. I, yeah. I think a lot of folks got caught up in making cute, catchy mm -hmm. 404 pages and trying to be as clever as they can and forgot about that technical component of it. That is a fantastic tip. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll serve up a 200. I've had huge, huge companies make that mistake. Like massive companies. It blows my mind. Right. Status code 200. It looks like a, a proper, nicely formatted air, custom error page, but they, they screwed up the technical implementation. Um, so, but with this client, I, I just found this issue where they have a custom error page, serves up a 404 properly, but then they have these other pages that are returning a, a zero result set. So it, it's a different kind of kind of error page. It's a low value page that they didn't consider to be an error, so they weren't serving up a status code, a 404 or you know whatever, 410 or whatever. It was a 200, which means this is a okay. This is a regular web page, and it had no content on it zero results return. So thankfully, Google was considering those as soft 404s. Mm -hmm. So they're treating them essentially like 404s, even though they're uh, being served up uh, with a status code of 200. But a lot of times that doesn't end up happening properly. So find those low value pages and um, treat them appropriately. Now, in this case, I'd say a 404 status code is the appropriate thing for a zero result set page return. It's essentially a, a an error page, nothing mm -hmm. found, right? No results found. But there are other page types where you're just going to want, like with faceted navigation yeah. or guided navigation, depending on how, whatever your terminology is that you use, where you can narrow down uh, the product set by like brand and, and size and color and price range and things like that. And you're just clicking around and, and, and you know, clicking the different attributes in the left nav or where, however it's formatted. And then it narrows down as you keep clicking. If that is all crawlable and um, uh, accessible to Googlebot and 
the, all those pages get indexed as separate pages. What a mess. You've created uh, a huge pile of duplicate content and near duplicate content. Yeah. And, and th that stuff shouldn't even be crawlable by Googlebot. So you got to figure out a way to make that faceted navigation, not even JavaScript is an appropriate way to block the spiders now because Googlebot is so uh, much more advanced these days mm -hmm. about crawling and executing JavaScript, uh, whatever content is, is within JavaScript or links, you cannot rely on that keeping the page rank from flowing. So getting back to that original concept of page rank sculpting, um, yeah, but I mean, one one way that you could do it, like let's say that you've got a lot of plumbing type of links. When I say plumbing, I mean like uh, the Chrome of the page, like mm -hmm. the, the functionality of the site uh, for core users, like view cart, check out, log in, sign up, um, that sort of stuff. You can do cookie based detection. And say, well, uh, Googlebot doesn't have cookies, and if if a user doesn't have cookies, then they're not going to have that access to that functionality anyways. It won't work. So let's just move those links off of the the cookie disabled version of the site. So um, it's it's not cloaking because you're not treating Googlebot any differently than you would be treating a cookie disabled user. Right. Because if they don't have cookies turned on, they can't add to cart or none of that functionality. You know, checkout doesn't work anyways. So um, you're completely within Google's guidelines there, and you have removed all that page rank leakage to those low value pages that won't even work for Googlebot or for uh, these cookies uh, turned off users anyways. We're at an interesting time now where a lot of companies are on their third website or their fourth website. And somewhere in those iterations, page A now became page F. Are your audits becoming more difficult because you now have to look backwards and see if all of those historical pages were redirected correctly, you've got to look more historical than perhaps you did when doing the same work two years ago? Um, it's, it's always been an issue. Uh, so he, he, here's how you're going to have to think about this is like, if you have inherited page rank from sources that you're now 404ing, a lot of times those will show up in your uh, 404 error report ins inside a Google search console. Now that might not be a comprehensive list, but it's a, it's a really good starting point. And uh, addressing all of those 404 errors and the ones that there, there are, are, will be a small number that you want to keep because they're non-functional URLs. Like ASDF, ASDF, I just tested to make sure that your site returned a 404 status code and now it's showing up in Google Search Console and the 404 report. Don't make that redirect to the home page. <laughs> It, it it should return a 404, but a lot of stuff that these are pages that used to exist and they've been moved uh, or products have been discontinued or what have you. Yeah, 301 that stuff. Now, there is some page rank loss in a 301. It's not a complete transfer. Maybe you lose 10%, 15% or something. It, but the vast majority of the page rank transfers in the 301. You want to recapture that. Mm -hmm. And the the best starting point for finding these uh, lost opportunities because when you have a 404 error uh, and, and there was a link authority flowing into that page, that page rank, that, that link authority gets uh, black holed. It just dissipates because it doesn't add any value to your site. So you, you want to 301 redirect that. Um, now, there'll be a lot of pages where all you have are internal links you, and, and no external links, no inbound links. And you might say, well, I don't need to worry about that because I'm just linking to that stuff myself. No, because you're actually bleeding page rank away from um, other pages and you're not recapturing that, right? Yep. So even if you have internal links, you should deal with that. Either get rid of the issue where you are linking to pages that no longer exist in the first place. Like, why are you doing that? <laughs> Stop it. Uh, but at a minimum, 301 redirect that stuff so that you're recapturing that, that page rank and flowing it more strategically. Yeah, and, and I would say that John Mueller had been pretty clear on 404 is not passing page rank from links to the site. Yeah, but... So. Yeah, and this is a significant okay, issue so, for anybody listening who manages inventory. If 
you've got a, a condominium that you're renting and it's available for this particular week and you've got a page about it, then it's no longer available. You've got to look at what your platform right. is doing to that page when and you user, when you yeah. uncheck it, yeah. right? Yeah, well, let me just throw in something about John Mueller. Okay. Great guy. Do not take everything that John or <laughs> any other Googler says <laughs> as gospel truth. Yeah, never. Okay, because... Their in, their incentives are not aligned with your incentives. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's fine what he's saying, but test this stuff for yourself. I've been saying this for so many years. I mean, in decades, I've been saying that 404s do not pass page rank or do not have any page rank. They they dissipate the page rank. So, whether or not John Mueller said it's true or not, test this stuff. This is an empirical science. Sure. I love SEO because you can test this stuff. I could be full of hot air. I could be just making stuff up on the fly. And you could tell if I'm doing that or not by testing these things. Right. Right. So you could test this idea of an H1 or an H6 doesn't matter. You could change the H1 to an H6 or mm -hmm. to a font tag and no rankings uh, hit. Right. Try it and see. Absolutely. Like, don't just take my word for it. This is an experimental science. Use the scientific method. Test this stuff out. Yep. I would definitely have to say that. <laughs> I mean, it's not, and make sure that when you're doing that testing, you're, you're, you're very, you know, change one thing. Don't change like you were talking earlier about that person yeah. said, you know. They ended exactly. Yeah. Got to be rigorous. Yes. And, and thoughtful. Come up with, with hypotheses that make sense and and make this test statistically significant and make it uh rigorous and and remove other extraneous variables yeah treat this like it's a real science experiment like your your grade in school is gonna ride on the correct implementation of the science lab or not right? mm -hmm. absolutely those of you just tuning in, you're listening to Search Talk Live. We have about 15 minutes left in the show. Uh, actually, less than that. Well, anyway, 14. <laughs> but anyway, um, we're talking with Stefan Spencer uh, on site auditing. And, and I am so sorry for kind of getting off your your train there, of, you know, where you were going with this. So let's let's get back on that track and and. And keep going. I'm sorry. I think we're on the third plank of yeah. the SEO auto, and let's talk about link building. Yeah, but we kind of keep going we, off. We do. And, it's a lot of great stuff to talk yeah. about. Uh, but, Stefan, kind of walk us through what, what makes your eyebrows go up when you're doing an audit of a site and you're looking at links. What makes you go, uh-oh, we got a problem? Right. So a lot of times people don't realize that there's this thing out there called negative SEO. And you might think, well, I never bought links. Oh, you might have but it just wasn't an employee at your company who did it for you. It was a competitor, mm -hmm. right? So that's something you got to check. You, you got to see, are these um, links squeaky clean or do I have toxic links pointing at my site? So that's one of the first things that I look for. I use a link detox uh, to triage the links. When I say triage, I mean, there's kind of three areas of uh, the kinds of types of links as far as quality. There are toxic links. There are suspicious links that will need to be evaluated to determine if they are toxic, right? So toxic or sus suspicious and then innocuous. Mm -hmm. So they're not harming you and they may be doing good. So if you say, oh, I, I got to clean up all my links because I was doing some link buys and I, what a mess. And, and then you end up removing a bunch of links that were adding value kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater mm -hmm. and uh, then your rankings just tank even worse. And you're like, what did I do? <laughs> I thought I was cleaning things up. You got to be very careful to properly triage these links and yeah. only toss out the toxic ones and then look at the suspicious ones by hand and make a determination. Is this toxic or is this innocuous? And then the, the, the remaining ones you don't mess with. Yeah. And, and you're not going to do a disavow on everything. You have to show your work essentially like you would to your teacher. Like, here's the right answer, but how did you come up with that? Mm -hmm. You got to show your work or you're getting an F. You got to do that with Google. So you got to show that you put in the effort by doing a bunch of link outreach to get links removed. So a lot of times people are doing link outreach to get links 
No, you're going to do link outreach to get these webmasters to remove the links, and you have to show a non-negligible negligible percentage of these toxic links have been removed in order for Google to, um, you know, take your uh, your disavow file and and apply it and be uh, let, let you out of the jailhouse essentially. Mm -hmm. right? So this is a really important area of link analysis and one that often gets missed. Like if you're just checking to see what's my uh, trust flow and citation flow scores according to Majestic and my Moz rank and Moz trust and page authority and domain authority according to Open Site Explorer. I'm writing. Uh, you should be writing down tools, by the way, guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Open Site Explorer is a Moz.com tool, uh, and Majestic is uh, another great tool for link analysis. Um, also, Link Research Tools. That's a great tool set uh, from uh, Christoph Kemper. Uh, so that's LinkResearchTools.com. I use all of these tools. Ahrefs.com yeah. because they're they have different algorithms, uh, different metrics and different crawls of the web. They're all uh, not as um, comprehensive of a crawl of the web as Googlebot does, but they're pretty good depending on which tool we're talking about. Right. So doing this link analysis and seeing, well, what looks suspicious, what looks toxic, and what looks engineered? Because So that's kind of the next step. Like what looks overly engineered mm -hmm. in terms of how I've acquired these links? That's a tough one. Right, and, and so you got to look at um, not just things like MozRank and MozTrust and that sort of stuff, but you've got to look at um, like where are, are these links placed? Are they in the footer? Are they site-wide links? Because that doesn't look very organic and kind of naturally occurring. That looks very engineered. Like you, you did a deal with somebody, even if you didn't pay for the link, if they're putting a site-wide link in their footer to your site, like what's up with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> not legit, right. not, not legit. So you, you really have to look at placement of the links and the, the distribution of types of links, uh, the, the distribution of, of the TLDs, like the top level domains. Mm -hmm. Are you getting a lot of dot biz and dot info links? Is it all dot coms uh, and no dot orgs and, and so forth. Like, what's the distribution look like? Does it look natural or does it look engineered? Uh, the distribution of the themes of the sites, right? So using a tool like Link Research Tools, you can see theme distribution. Like, okay, he here's a big distribution of shopping-related links and very few, uh, like, online community-type sites and very few news-type sites. But my site's a content site. What's up with all the shopping links and no other types of links? So all that stuff has to be analyzed. So that's part of the, the link analysis portion of, of the audit. So um, I, I name dropped a, a handful of tools. Let me give you guys a bunch more to, you know, kind of round out, round out the tool set. And yeah. we didn't go deep in, enough into the technical section. So I'm going to actually throw in some uh, additional technical tools as well. So um, there's the structured data testing tool from Google, a, a free tool that checks to see if you have correct microdata markup, schema.org markup on, uh, you know, whatever you're, you're marking up. Hopefully you are marking up some stuff on your site, right? So things like prices and uh, stock inventory, or I mean, stock availability um, in stock or out of stock, that sort of thing. Um, ratings and reviews, if you have uh, that functionality on your site, you should absolutely be marking that up. Uh, so you need to make sure that you're using the, the proper markup. It's, there are no syntax errors and that sort of thing. So that's where the structured data testing tool comes in. Um, there, there are uh, page speed analysis tools. Of course, the one most of you will have heard of, hopefully, is Google's page speed insights tool. But there are many other tools that will do page analysis as well as speed you know, testing. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, a page, uh, the full page test, FPT, uh, from Pingdom uh, is, is a, a free tool. You just put in a, a URL and it will test uh, the download speed. And you can have it test different cities, different parts of the world, the, the page uh, download time. You can actually just use your web browser 
to get uh, data on how things are loading. Right? You, you can see what's loading in parallel, what's loading in serial. Some things have to finish loading before, before other things load on the page, and that's a problem. So uh, that makes the page perceived as, as slower loading. You don't want that because this, this, this will really hurt your conversion, not just your SEO. It's not a huge factor right now, page speed, uh, in the r Google rankings algorithm, but it's huge for conversion. So really work on optimizing your page speed. And there are two great books on this topic of page speed optimization, both written by Steve Souders. Steve uh, is a fellow O'Reilly author, and his two books that I highly recommend are high, high performance websites, and the other one's called Even Faster Websites. One, is, one book is more kind of skewed towards server-side optimizations, and the other is more skewed towards client-side optimizations, but you need both. And um, if this is too technical for you and your team, then uh, hire out this uh, kind of uh, server tuning, page speed tuning sort of uh, um, function, right? So yeah. um, W3Edge, for example, does um, server tuning. They're the guys that make the, uh, the W3 um, uh, Total Cache plugin mm -hmm. for WordPress. And so if you have a WordPress site and you need your server tuned because it's uh, getting uh, red on PageSpeed Insights, hire these guys and get them to turn your, uh, tune your server. So server-side optimizations would be things like uh, gzip compression mm -hmm. and um, not having a whole lot of... Uh, nonsense running in the background that's slowing the server down. Client-side optimizations are things like changing the order of things loading in the page, like um, the uh, order of JavaScripts and, and of um, uh, CSS files and things like mm -hmm. that. The order matters, whether it's going to load in serial or load in par parallel. You want parallel because that is perceived faster loading. And the way that you – back to just using your web browser – Inside of the uh, Google Chrome browser is the developer tools, and yeah. this is your new best friend, and it's such a great set of tools. This is just one of many, many features. Like you, There's another feature I love to use, which is um, it has an iPhone emulator built right in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Firebug. So right? cool. Um, right into the developer tools. You yeah. don't even need Firebug. Okay. Well, yeah, it's... I'm sorry, Stephen, we're running out of time here, and I want to give some time to, you know, let the listeners know about uh, your book and where they can get it if they wanted to um, uh, and that type of stuff. We can wrap yeah, up yeah, real yeah. quick. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I know this is a deep subject. I mean, <laughs> this is why an audit takes me like five hours to present my findings yeah. and recommendations. It, it's a deep dive. Well, we'll just keep having you come back. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm game. Uh, I'll, I'll see you next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I want people to check out your books because um, The Art of SEO I've read, I think it's one of the best out there. Um, you constantly keep that up to date. Um, you just recently updated that last year, right? Yep, yep, less than a year ago. Um, you have Google Power Search and mm -hmm. uh, Social E-Commerce. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those real quick? I, I mean, we only got like three, two minutes now, but... Uh, well, I'll do even better. I'll let you, your listeners get a free copy of one of these books. Wow. Oh, uh, wow. Which is, yeah, this, this uh, I have a great publisher. O'Reilly is awesome. So, uh, yeah, love these guys. So they have uh, graciously offered to give uh, your listeners a free copy of one of my three books. So your choice. And um, just simply go to this URL and please do not share this URL with your friends or colleagues. Do not retweet it. D please don't even put it in the show notes because this okay. is a super secret URL and it's O R E I L <laughs> dot L Y slash S S two zero one six L Y dot. Or, SS2016. So okay. SS2016. Gotcha. And I'll read that back just in case it's O R I E L. No, no. O R E I L. Dot L. So the word O'Reilly. Okay. Slash SS2016. Got it. Okay. It's recorded, so we can always go back and play again. 
<laughs> Good thing we double checked. <laughs> I want to thank you again, Stephen, for being on the show. Great insights and advice on uh, just everything to do with uh, SEO audits on a website. And I also want to thank uh, Matt Weber for uh, fit, uh, sitting in for uh, Caleb McKelvin, uh, which here. will be back next week on the show. And uh, be sure and tune in next week. We have Neil Patel, which is one of the top online marketers online. Uh, be sure and tune in next Tuesday at 3.30. Matt, thank you again. If you guys want to visit. Enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, visit Roar uh, on the web.com. Is that right? That's right, Roar on the web.com. Yeah. Thanks. Search Talk Live is a presentation of the Robert Palmer family of companies.